Hello, this is Miss Sassic with our second part of our Revolutionary War battles. We are finishing the notes today, so make sure you got them ready to go. Okay, so we just uh, left off with the Battle of Saratoga, how that was the turning point of the war. Things at that time uh, were looking pretty bad for the Americans until we got to Saratoga, where we had a huge victory over the British. So the French were watching us do this. Um, and after seeing the victory at Saratoga, France agrees to join the war against Britain. Think back to exploration where we talked about how France, Spain, and England, how they kind of didn't have this relationship with each other. Well, France was all for getting into war with England. And that's Drew. He says hello. Along with the soldiers and supplies that they sent, they sent a very large part of their navy to help us out. So the Continental Army now has a powerful ally that can attack the British at home. So they started going to war with the British um, also at home. <laughs> there you see part of the, Brit uh, the French uh, ships helping us out. Okay, so also we had another ally. This one we probably you probably don't know about too much because you hear a lot of the French and how they helped us with the military. We had the Spanish, and the Spanish were uh, really encouraged by how we were doing. And so they started sending us, uh, they sent us supplies and money instead of soldiers. Um, they did help us with soldiers, uh, and the way they did that is they decided to declare war against um, Britain back in Europe. So that forced Great Britain to keep soldiers at home um, to protect the homeland. So here you see the Spanish soldiers um, painting, fighting the British. So we're going to flash forward a little bit. Uh, 1781. So uh, Washington has his army surrounding, um, well, they, they're chasing the British to the south. And the British were counting on to get support from their navy. So they end up in this little town in Virginia called uh, Yorktown along the York River, not far from the Chesapeake Bay. And the French Navy surrounded the British Navy. And now the British are surrounded not only on water, but um, by land by the Americans. Now, the British were commanded by General Cornwallis, as you see here, Lord Cornwallis. And there's Washington, General of the Continental Army. So this might be a little bit blurry to see, but here is um, the map showing how the Navy was surrounded, um, the British, the French Navy, and then you see some of the land, um, land engagements as well in Yorktown. Okay, so surrender. So... Britain was in a really tight spot with nowhere to go. Uh, Lord Cornwallis had no choice to surrender. So he was so uh, ashamed of the surrender. He, you know, he's very well-respected general, very um, intelligent, very smart about his maneuvers. The fact that he had to surrender was extremely embarrassing to him. Um, he couldn't believe that it was possible. He was also a lord, so he was nobility. So the fact that these, you know... Americans who are not from noble birth, who were just a bunch of farmers and merchants and whatever they were, joined an army and just decided to, to fight the greatest uh, na Navy and army on earth and won was actually a big deal. So he, when he went to surrender to uh, George Washington, he did not go. He sent his number two. And at this point, most of the British army has been captured and the war is basically over. So not officially over because we have to sign a treaty. When you have a war, yes, you after you surrender, you got to go sign a fancy paper saying that it's officially over and here are the terms. So this was called the Treaty of Paris. So the Americans and the British sent representatives to Paris and they negotiated what they wanted in the treaty in several meetings. Now, um, the United States of America is now officially recognized as an independent nation. And the British agree to remove the soldiers off their land. Also, as another um, 
requirement for the treaty, uh, England had to give up a lot of the territories that it had gained uh, to America. So if you look at the map, you see a lot of that land is west of the proclamation of 1763. So America more than doubles in size. So it's from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River. So the revolution is now officially over. And if you look here, this is a photograph of what the Treaty of Paris looks like. So you can go see it. I can't remember the museum. You can go visit it, but um, you, I mean, it, it exists today. So some of the strengths we have of the Americans, military strengths. Well, we are fighting for patriotism. Men were willing to fight for their country, fight for their independence. And that is a big deal. That is a huge thing to be fighting for, especially you have had your rights denied for so long. They wanted to fight for their freedom. Home field advantage. Colonists knew the land very well. Think about Lexington and Concord. The, the militiamen grew up there. And so they knew every... Uh, path in the woods, every back road, because those bridges were running back on the main road. So they knew all the shortcuts. And then you have George Washington. He was a strong leader, and he inspired the men to keep fighting. Okay, people really respected and looked up to him, and so uh, a lot of people admired that about him. So they wanted to, to please him and fight for him. And also France and Spain, they were extremely... Uh, vital for our success. Had France not sent, you know, supplies and their navy to help us out, and if Spain hadn't had a war back in England and sent us supplies themselves, who knows what could have happened. Okay, the British strengths. Biggest army and navy in the world. I mean, huge. Doesn't even come close to it. They are very experienced and well-trained. Uh, they get up, eat breakfast, and they go fight in the army. This is what they do. Um, and then we also had 30,000 Hessian missionaries. So Hessians were from Germany, a province in Germany, and that also helped make their army a lot larger because, as you can imagine, it was already an expensive and big ordeal. And then if you have Spain trying to fight you at home, you're going to need some people to help you out. Some of the American weaknesses, small army, almost no navy at all, untrained and experienced soldiers. Remember, these guys were people who were farming, people who had their own small businesses, and most of them did not have any experience as a soldier unless they were a veteran in the uh, British Army during the French Indian War. No money to pay for the war, no money to pay for soldiers. That was another reason why it was hard to retain soldiers is uh, the Congress, Continental Congress, was struggling to find money to, to pay these people and to keep them fed and keep them clothed and keep them well. It was a struggle. And that leads to this, the last point, constantly short on weapons, uniforms, food, and supplies. I mean, it's a lot of work to have an army and a, have a military. You have all these things that you have to uh, supply for. Weaknesses of the British, well, much of their army was back in Great Britain. And leads us to the second point. Getting these soldiers and supplies to America took time and money. You had to put them on a boat. You had to pay for the boat. You had to pay for the supplies. Boat. You had to pay for the people to sail the boat. You had to pay for the soldiers, and you have to outfit all the soldiers. It's an extremely expensive ordeal. And there's no motivation for these soldiers. I mean, it's not their homeland. It's not, uh, they're not fighting for freedom. They're fighting because they are ordered to. And that was their job. And these generals had um, did not have very good leadership skills. I mean, obviously, Lord Cornwallis, we talk about, was a very good, well-respected general. But, you know, these guys uh, struggled with what was given to them.